Sometimes, even though it looks good on the external, you might be living nowhere near what the truest you is or your potential. You could just create your own thing, your way. And I really believe the universe is trying to give you all these unique ways of doing whatever you want. And there's no rules. But if I don't keep creating, my mind will creatively sabotage me. I had that moment at the hospital where I'm in the waiting room right after I was at the beach figuring out if I should go buy a gun and feeling the motions of really considering suicide. This ended up becoming the only thing I thought of, became only what I was obsessed with. The belief in my mind was, I'm not going to be able to not think about this. Sometimes giving up's good if you replace it with the universe, if you replace it with God. If you really let everything fall off that needs to, your giving up can be a real gift. I one time was in a club and I asked a comedian, I said, how do comics make really good money? And he said, well, there's corporate parties. Companies have a party or whatever. I remember him also saying, you're probably too young for that. I didn't even hear that part. I was just like, how do I do corporate parties? And I asked my mom, I said, where do corporations meet up? And she told me there's, the ch there's this thing called the Chamber of Commerce, which is like all these heads of businesses meet up. And in Redmond, that was like Microsoft, Sears, Nintendo, like all like in Redmond, Washington, many of the companies in the Chamber of Commerce were parts of enormous corporations. And so I called the Chamber of Commerce and I asked them, can I get the mailing labels for the businesses there? And they said, it's 50 bucks. And I remember my mom being like, why are you spending 50 bucks? And I was like, I'm going to go give them. I drove over with 50 cash and I was like, can I get the labels? And they gave me, I don't remember, 500, 700 labels. And I made a very basic, are you having a corporate party looking for entertainment? Call Kyle Cease. And I, and I mailed it to all of them and paid, you know, the stamp for whatever it was, 500. And my mom's like, why are you spending this money or whatever? And next thing I know, I'm doing corporates at 15 for Sears, Nintendo. I brought a keyboard. I, I did impressions a lot at that time. I had a card. I had a business card also that said comedian impressionist. And then the, the thing said under it, <laughs> it said, finally, a good Julia Child impression at an affordable price. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I think that's what, that's what everyone's looking for. Right? Like, like my usual Julia Child impressions are too much. So is there a price I can? And I, it was funny because I would, I would do the stuff and, and make agreements with these businesses and, and I would go and do the gigs. And here's this 15 year old being driven to their gig in, mm -hmm. in like a full suit holding a keyboard. And I would do like Lexus's corporate event or, you know, and that was just because my body was like, oh, how do I? And then I just did it. And I did, there was an oblivion that I'm realizing I had that was so amazing. And, and, and the oblivion was taking me from the world of you. It doesn't work that easy. You can't do that. All of those things that people say, like, you'd be too young to do that. Or if you want to get a movie, you need to do this and this and this first. Like I booked 10 things I hate about you without an agent or audition experience or a headshot, you know, and it was because you could just create your own thing your way. And I really believe the universe is trying to give you all these unique ways of doing whatever you want. And there's no rules as long as you're not hurting anyone and it's expansive, you know? And so um, we, we go, usually there's a, a route to do everything that everyone else does. And that's what kind of makes you cattle. Like if you want to get in the movie, you're going to go through an agent and submit 9 million headshots to agents and then hope and do the process. Like at one point I was so oblivious. I was, booking work every day and doing, you know, I even, I remember, I remember getting Cracker Jack boxes and making a, a audio demo tape of me doing voiceover work and putting it in the Cracker Jack boxes and sending it to producers. Um, and, and they sent it out, you know, or I sent it out and they would open the Cracker Jack box and there'd be this demo tape that they'd put in the car and uh, they'd hear me and then I'd get work. I was suddenly doing like voiceover for kids educational software and different things like that. And, you know, there was a company called Edmark that called me all the time. And it was weird because at the time, I don't remember the price, but I might have been making like somewhere between 150 and 200 an hour. 
but when you're 15, that's weird. And it's, and it's 94, you know, that was a crazy thing to be experiencing. So did you have, yeah. did you have any, any exposure to any sort of spiritual ideologies or philosophies back in those late teen not, days? Not really, but because of our kind of counterculture way of being, my family saw any of that as just a scam. Like, mm, you know, trying, like mainstream, mainstream, uh, churches have an agenda, you know, uh, I remember there was a woman named Romtha. Do you know who that is? Yeah, 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 of course. Yeah, yeah. I read all of her books. Yeah. She, so that the lady was in, you know, we, we lived in Washington at the time when she was really big. I think she still is, but you know, that was just J, in, JK something or another. I can't remember. Yeah. I can't remember her name either. I want to say Rowling, but that's Harry Potter lady. I know. But, but yeah. And like, so I remember them being like the Romtha is doing this thing. And there was this very, it was a bizarre combination of counterculture making fun of things through comedy meets mainstream media's belief system, you know? So we were very like, we didn't go to church. So if I ever I asked my parents a religious thing, like, what is God? Like, you just kind of feel this, like, I don't know. And then my dad wanting to look like he'll have a big talk, but he didn't really have a specific. <laughs> He's always, oh, well, let's talk about, it. but there was not really, I don't know. It was, but not saying, I don't know. It was just kind of like, it was not a thing yet. And then when I was in my early twenties as a comic, I always look at what I do now. And if you showed the kid, if you showed me at 23 as a stand-up comic, that what I will be doing at 45 will be often shifting 60 year old women out of their traumas. You know, I mean, <laughs> my audience is all ages, but, you know, our absolutely everything passes primarily, you know, women. And I'm, you know, there's moments I've been at like a retreat center, like in Rhythmia or something, and I'm sitting with 10 people. If you show this aspiring kid who was on his way to Comedy Central and everything, hey, just so you know, here's you in your, here's you in your 40s. I'd be mm -hmm. like, I become everything I make fun of. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, because the me in my 20s would have been making fun of what me in my 40s is, mm -hmm. you know. Did you have a, do you have like an Obi-Wan Kenobi figure in your life at that time, in your hero's journey, kind of mentoring you or giving you insight That's a about great, life? Another weird oblivion that I had was I always connected to what I perceived as the highest frequency in the room, even as a child. So to give you an example, I was more bonded with, this is an embarrassing thing to say, but I was more bonded with the teachers than the students in, in school. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, it would almost be like me and my third grade teacher, Mr. Sissel sitting there and me being like, what are these kids going to be up to? Just like, I'm, I'm like <laughs> acting like him. Like I know what life's like and I'm seeing it through his perspective. But Here's where that really got cool, though, was in stand-up comedy, when I started doing the big clubs in Seattle, I really loved the headliners more than the people that were where that were the beginners where I was. Like I saw them as as people to bond with. And every amazing artist, I would always think that's available. That level of good is available. And so when I and so I became good really quickly because I wasn't really in the open mic circuit as much as I did a couple open mics, then was asked by those headliners to tour with them. And I was suddenly seeing only the best work. It's really powerful to see the very best and just continually be surrounded by that versus getting caught in a sea of people that are all new at it. And we're all in this cynicism of how hard it is and in that frequency, because I was a working comic really quickly and almost oblivious to that it will take time and it's not that easy and everything and really moving up to the best me. And then when I booked 10 Things I Hate About You, I lived in Seattle. And when it came out, I moved to LA and I remember seeing the best comics there. And I would be in the lineup at night at the Laugh Factory with, you know, Dane Cook and, and Howie Mandel and Rodney Dangerfield and Chris Rock and... I was there nightly and I, I remember when the best would go on and sometimes 
some comics would reject that. Like I remember Dane Cook going up and some comics not liking it or something like that and leaving and kind of staying connected to each other in their hatred of the ones that were successful or something. But to me, I'm like, that's that. It, and it's the same pattern as me bonding with the teacher about the other students. It's like, who's the best I want to open to them. And, and I did. And, and it was, it was amazing because I saw those comics as permission, inspiration, and the level I wanted to be at. And so I toured and had really good sets because I saw a world where the hardest level of killing was possible. And so, and then that, and that transcended to after leaving the comedy world and feeling like that was done, seeing that in Wayne Dyer or Michael Beckwith or just, you know, the heroes of spirituality and becoming friends with like Michael Beckwith and speaking at Agape and, and working with people that were <clears throat> the best that I could find. And now it's down to God. It really is. I'm noticing the, the, the teacher in the room now that I connect to is that higher self that's trying to get me to be more that higher self. Mm -hmm. And boy, is that, is that a revelation? Like, it's like, that's the highest there is. That's the highest and your awareness grows. So then the highest is you and, you know, you or, or God or the universe or whatever that, that, that's the one that I'm listening to the most now. Hey, really quickly, if you like this content or if you don't like it, let me know down in the comments because your likes and comments are going to help me learn what you want more of. And then that way I can keep bringing you the good stuff. All right. Thanks so much for your feedback and back to the show. A couple more questions about these developmental years as a comedian. Sure. Obviously you had a lot of experience. You put in your 10,000 hours of that comedy, uh, the college tour, but I'm curious looking back, looking back now, what do you recognize was your, what, what made you so successful compared to what everybody else was doing and compared to what you thought made you successful back in the early days? Hmm. What made me so as, as and this is in the stand up world? You said you killed a lot. Yeah. And in the early days you were killing, which is, which is comedy uh, jargon for you. You were very, they, they went very, Keep very well. Yeah. yeah. And that, that's by the way. Weird that it's called killing because bombing, which also means a type of killing, <laughs> right. um, it means, means you did horribly. Did, yeah. So if you bomb, you did bad, but if you killed, you did great. Um, so you have to have a very specific type of murdering if you want to do well. Um, <laughs> a cup, I, I think one thing that honestly helped me a lot was having booked a couple of big teen movies and being college age. I would perform at these conventions of, called NACA where different colleges would get together and they would book the entertainment for the year. And I would have a set that was kind of edgy and talked about things that they grew up with, like blowing into the original Nintendo, the Pillsbury Doughboy, Sunny Delight. Like I had all these bits that were very topical for our age combined with that I had been in those teen movies. And I got to do so many and so I, in my 20s, performed nightly, either headlining a comedy club or doing what started off as hour-long sets, but kept going to longer. And I, you know, it was like boot camp for me because I would go on a tour. I remember one time doing, I don't know if this number's right, this might be wrong, but doing, I think, 168 colleges in a row and literally no day off. So you're doing two, three flights a day, you're exhausted, but you get to the gig and just rip it. And you would have the set and, and I would watch, I went up so many times that the act started writing itself when I was on stage. In other words, I'd have these little kind of tangents on a bit that would go off and longer. Sometimes I'd pretend like I made a mistake, like in other words, and then go off and then do a tangent bit on that. And I, I just noticed as long as I kept going up, I did another set and I would get paid for it and prove to my mom that I was legitimate with a check that the colleges were giving me and they were crazy pay. And that was the constant drive that I overlooked my health. I overlooked sleeping. I overlooked everything. But boy, did I go up a lot. And then when I went back to LA, those are like showcase clubs. So I'd be doing 10 minute sets, which was 
almost harder for me than doing an hour and a half. But like I had so much material just developing its set, itself. And then you just kind of start trying a potential thing and it would write. So what made it go well was doing it every day. I mean, it's it's that basic. And and I wasn't practicing every day. I was doing it every day. And they're they're mm. different. You know, practicing is this kind of energy that later is better. This mm -hmm. was I'm in my completeness every second I'm doing it and it's getting better as I'm doing it, right? Like, mm. so I'm doing it again and I'm doing it again. But that kind of energy of uh, over there is the goal. Like this isn't doing any, it's just doing it for that was, would be very minimal compared to the energy of me in this, right? So you've written, you've written about how you got to a point where you just got bored, you stopped creating the material and... I don't know which came, which came before, but you started having panic attacks as well. So can you talk a little bit about that period of time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was, that was the opening to my first shift, right? Mm -hmm. Meaning like this is, this is the first moment of me understanding there's a matrix, there's more than this, there's, there's a, a changing of thinking available. This is the kind of the beginning of the revelation. I'm a comedian before I'm a person and that. I was also, because of all those colleges, I was able to do my act also pretty much in my sleep. In other words, if I wasn't writing more, and it, there were times where I could go up on stage, do an hour and a half, and maybe I'd throw something in every once in a while, but it wasn't a challenge at all. And on the internal, there was boredom. And on the external, I'm killing. And I, and I really believe if you don't keep creating, this is kind of a thing that I've said, this is a, especially for that consciousness. It's kind of, I have new thoughts now on this whole thing, but if I don't keep creating, my mind will creatively sabotage me. And mm. sometimes even though it looks good on the external, you might be living nowhere near what the truest you is or your potential. And just because I was able to go on stage and kill doesn't mean I wasn't, that I was being challenged anymore. I could go on stage, rip the place apart and be bored inside. So one day my mind really creatively came up with this bizarre thought. I'll never forget. I'm on stage in Mesquite, Nevada. I'm, and I have this thought, I wonder if you could think about it enough if you could make yourself faint. And then mm. right when I thought that, I got dizzy and I, I felt myself whiting out for a second. And I was like, I just remember everything going white and me just being like, what the and I had this fear and I was on the external. I'm just killing. I'm doing a show and blah, 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 blah. Just having a great set. And inside I'm, my mind is going, what the hell was that? Like, I'm, I don't know what I'm even saying on the external. I'm mm -hmm. much more listening to the inside while some habit is doing its thing. And I walk off stage and I said to a couple other comics, like I have this bizarre thing that I could make myself faint when I'm on stage. And they're like, oh yeah, you totally could. You know, they, you could keep thinking about it. And the underlying belief that I hadn't gotten to for years later is if I faint while I'm on stage, then my career's over and then I'm, I'm no person. I'm not, I don't exist if I don't have comedy. Like there's, I'm not loved if I don't have comedy. I'm not, no one will see me. And no one, I don't need to be here. And so the, the ego was like, we got to keep, we got to keep this fit. We got to fix this. So. I remember the next day, me starting to obsess over it and being worried that when I got on stage that night, that I'd make myself faint. And I would think about it all day and I'd picture, I started picturing it. I started seeing me collapsing. And this, this started escalating so much more. And this also happened, I think, because I didn't sleep years before. I was touring so much and eating drive through drinking at night and then drinking coffee in the morning with two hours of sleep, an hour or whatever, nothing just getting to the next gig. And so my body was just full of crap. It was just full of drive through and nothing and whatever, and no exercise, nothing. And so this ended up becoming an anxiety that became the only thing I thought of, became only what I was obsessed with. The every second was just, and all I would see when I'd see people all of a sudden on TV or something is them fainting or them falling apart. And basically the belief was you can't not think about something, right? So the belief in my mind was, I'm not going to be able to not think about this. And so that's the whole thing. 
And while I was at the height of it, when it was at the very worst levels, I booked my first Comedy Central appearance with three months notice. And my manager goes, it's this show called Premium Blend. And my manager goes, uh, well, don't blow it. And the first thing I thought was, how would I blow it? What if I faint on that? And this became this obsession that every second for three months, I was just, it, it was in my body to a point where I, I, it got to even worse than just on stage. It was everywhere. And I got to a point where I couldn't walk anymore. I got scared of the biggest anxiety came once when I was on a gym floor with a junior high school doing an assembly. And this created this reverse claustrophobia where I got really big anxiety when I was on a big, hard floor that was wide open. I wanted small things that I could hold on to the side that created this anxiety. So for three months, I just pictured myself fainting on it and got really worried about it and worried about how it would ruin my career. And this is my big shot with Company Central and I'm going to blow it. And I just got all this practice and I'm the I'm so good as a comedian and now I'm not going to be able to, it's my one shot. And so I, I did premium blend and I did it way faster than usual because every second was just me holding the mic stand like this. My feet turned into me thinking, don't faint, don't faint, don't faint, don't faint. And I walk off stage and I'm so happy it's done. And it's seconds later, they're like, you got a comedy central half hour. But that was so good. You got a half hour special. And I'm like, it wasn't good. And I, and, I now I'm going to worry about feigning on that. The girl I was dating got worried about that. Now I'm going to hear you worry about that. And she had a point. But after that, there was a moment that was really big where I was obsessing over it again. And I was like, I'm going to go get, I'm going to go get anxiety medication. And I, I remember being at the beach before that and really picturing going to a gun shop actually and just ending this because I was so miserable that the, all the opportunities I've wanted are finally showing up when I'm not ready for them all of a sudden. And um, I, yeah, I was like, I'll, I'll go to, I guess I won't kill myself. I'll go to the hospital. And I signed in and the waiting took too long. The, 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 I, I sat in the waiting room for 45 minutes and I heard a voice go, get up. This was a big moment in my life because I, I wonder if I was, they were on time, if I would be alive because I might've been addicted to pills and not actually ascended myself and learned what this was. But I felt a voice go, get up. And I just was like, okay. And, and I was like, I, but I, I had all the yeah, buts, like they'll be mad at me <laughs> if you go like everything. But I just got up and I walked out and I, I, I remember calling my mom, like, I'm, I'm going to face this thing. I heard a voice. And my, my mom was just like, why do you have some weird anxiety thing? Like it was just this, Never mind. Okay. I'll figure this out myself. And I went to a Borders bookstore and I typed in anxiety into the search and all these, aside from fixing anxiety books, the whole self-help section was where they were located. And so mm -hmm. I, I found Tony Robbins and I'm like, I've heard of that guy. And I, I got a Tony Robbins book. I got Awaken the Giant Within. And this new level of hope started showing up. Uh, there was a thing he said. It's true. You, he said, it's true. You can't not think about something, which addressed the thing I was worried about. But he goes, you also can't think of two things at the same time. So I thought, I never, what if I replace something that's exciting and challenging, but is beyond, you know, what I'm used to? So instead of me being like, don't faint on the Comedy Central half hour special, I thought, how can I have the number one Comedy Central special? And I started spending every day with full anxiety, waking up, jumping out of the bed and saying out loud, you have the number one Comedy Central special. I'm like running around the house. Like you're the best comedian ever. You're blah, blah, blah. I'm saying this to myself. And I remember the first day getting 10 minutes in and feeling the anxiety, not having as much of a hold and me being like, holy shit, that was just 10 minutes in. Like, what if I keep going? So I got excited about like, that was like the first day at the gym. What if I did a hundred days? And the, the special was going to be recorded like 90 days down the road or whatever. So every day I did this hour picturing it was number one thing. It's funny because where I live now is at such a different consciousness than this story, but it's really the beginning of just the, the changing your thinking level. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I, I got to the special and I was excited about it and free of the anxiety, probably 90% free of it. and. Mm -hmm. 
And it was the most, it was the number one special. It was the most played special in 2006. And it got a major standing ovation and it was great. And this was the beginning of this Tony Robbins make it happen achievement phase that is a great stage in my life that was totally needed. And so it's funny because Michael Beckwith has a book called Life Visioning. And he talks in the, the book about four stages of awakening. And this was the beginning of from one to two. And for me, he talks about the first level is called to me, where you're in this victim mentality of everything is happening to me. It's because of my, my mother. It's because of the economy or my ex. That's why my circumstances are this. And the way I also phrase it is eventually to me runs you into the ground. You become addicted. You become suicidal. Or you go into a second stage where you learn how to change your circumstances, which is that second make it happen motivation by me stage, right? And it says you, you get from the first, and it says in Michael Beckwith's book, you get from the first stage to the second stage by releasing, you get to each stage by releasing something. First to second happens when you release blame. Now you'll still have times where you have blame, but it's not the main running only thing. You know, you start to get, there's a you, there's, you can change the circumstance or whatever. So the second of the four stages is by me. And that's the achieving world. That's the people that have a million Lamborghinis and, you know, are building the businesses and number one. And my opinion is eventually that also can run its course because you're still under the illusion that you are these things you're achieving. And even though you're not run by your circumstances anymore, you're still a victim to if they fall apart. So you're still very control-based, right? And so I went through a few years of, through massive effort and force and making it happen, having really good Comedy Central stuff, having a good comedy career, and Tony Robbinsing my way through everything, making it happen, achieving, and it was great, right? So that's kind of how I got to the second stage. I want to just go back and talk, talk about one thing. You said that voice that told you to, get up and leave, right? That voice plays a prominent role in your life later on. And I'm, I'm curious, was that one of the first times that you followed it? Or was I think that, that something you were used to doing at the I time? Think that, yeah, I think that there's a level of volume based on what you're following. In other words, mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're following a lot, the more you follow, you're screwed, life isn't that easy, then that voice is really loud. But mm -hmm. I was, I, I, by the way, this is not, I sure don't recommend this method to anybody, but I notice I always hear that new voice right after my edge of suicide <laughs> because it's actually the literal death of an old story happening. And, and I believe that there's, it's not us that's suicidal. Our stories are trying to die. Our ways that we were were trying to die. And a belief system, a, a, you know, a relationship, an identity is trying to die. And if you start to get your just this moment and what you used to be is trying to die, this is going to be amazing, right? But if you think that's you, you're trying to stop that voice that is needing to die from dying. It'd be like thinking you're the skin cells that are dying all day and trying to trap them on and negotiate this. It's like, let, let, let what's not you fall off. But, you know, I had that moment at the hospital where I'm in the waiting room right after I was at the beach, figuring out if I should go buy a gun and feeling the motions of really considering suicide. And um, finally just feeling through that and crying a little bit and being like, what do I do? And then after a little bit of surrender and like, I'm lost, I don't know what to do. There's kind of an opening for asking God for help. There's kind of an opening for... I don't know. I'm like, there's not the, the old story of Kyle can't fix this. A mm. higher level of Kyle that I've never seen before can. And I think that because I really felt through, I, I give up. Mm. I suddenly heard a new voice because I wasn't fighting from the old voice anymore. And this voice was quiet, but I remember hearing it and following it and it got louder. Mm. Like it, because I said yes to it, it could have been a passing voice, but I just, I just was like, I don't want to get, I all don't know what to do. I don't want to have an anxiety forever, but
but I don't want to just numb it and just have a bunch of pills too. I don't only want that. And I sure don't have any problem with what everyone else chooses. But for me, there was something about that that was like a kind of a numbing giving up versus a good giving up. Sometimes giving up's good if you if you replace it with the universe, if you replace it with God. If you really let everything fall off that needs to, your giving up can be a real gift. Because then you can hear higher voices and you can hear next steps and you can hear permission and you can hear synchronicity and miracles and all of that's here. And it's it starts to be normal when you follow it, right? So so that voice was really a big voice in my life. And because I do think if I had ignored it, I really, I don't know if I would have stayed a comic, if I'd just be on pills my whole life, if I would have never transcended it. Maybe I would have still had the same awakenings later. I don't know. I don't know what would have happened, but that was- I imagine that voice was the thing that guided you to the Tony Robbins material. Totally. And and so once you started absorbing that, as a student of life, like most comedians are, did you start working that into your comedy? Like when did the spiritual content start to- make an appearance in the in yeah. the bits that you were doing at that time. It did. There was this subtle desire and on both ways for the comedy to have a little bit of positive permission, but also I was just becoming also a coach and motivated and like like so the so there were a couple of things. There were bits that I did I did a bit where I said, it's so weird because you can make anything fun. Like I'm gonna make my death fun. Like I say on stage like, we're all going to die. Why not have fun with it? Why do we worry all the way until the death? And we're like, you guys, I'm going to die. And then we die. And we're like, see, I told you I'd die. And you're like, how are you talking to me? And I said, <laughs> the last 10 seconds, when I have everyone gathered around in the hospital, I'm going to get my body into a very nice, tight, entangled yoga pretzel position, just like a really stiff knot, because I know that your body gets stiff when you die. And I want to make it very hard for my family to unscramble me. And, <laughs> and this whole bit, form from that. And then there was a great bit about the news is just trying to make you depressed. And I said, uh, I, I, God, I'm trying to remember. It's so weird because it was a huge bit of mine, but now I'm trying to remember I said it. I said, can you imagine how not scared of flying we would be if the news just told us about the 30,000 flights a day that made it? Yeah. With when the same- walk off, how was your- yeah, with the same landing. with the same breaking news intensity because that's also news. A plane took off and landed. That's way more news to me yeah. than the planes that didn't make it. So I think every time a plane lands, they should interrupt whatever they should mm -hmm. whatever show you're watching and interview every person as they're getting off the plane. You'd be like, "Oh, I want to try flying." And then I say something like, "And then they don't. They scare the crap out of you." And then they list all these pills that have all the side effects in the commercials for anxiety that they just gave you. And I mm -hmm. realized I'm kind of coaching them in through standup, but not, mm. not point blank saying it. Like I'm not preaching, mm. but I'm, but it is an angle that was feeling really positive and good and calling bullshit on darkness and making death. Okay. These are good spiritual principles, but made comedic. So in 2009, the act started getting there. And mm -hmm. it had a combination of regular stand up and observe observational stuff, but that too. And I really went through a phase that I am letting go of, of when that I know, I'm sure you know what I mean, that when you have your first awakenings, you want everyone to know about it mm -hmm. and you need everyone to know that they can have this thing. Mm -hmm. And because I went from suicidal anxiety to number one Comedy Central special through Tony Robbins and changing my thinking. And that same me that was oblivious to what everyone thinks would just get in everyone's face and be like, dude, you can have everything you want. You can have an amazing. And now I'm looking at me like I might as well have go knocked to their door and said, have you found Jesus or something? Because, you know, like I'm just coaching everyone uninvited, thinking that what I'm offering them, they'll want. But really forgetting and not knowing until way later that a factor in my shift was my fall apart, my depression, my my lostness, my need for it. And not every, you know, if I had coached the me in 2002, he, I, that me would have been like, get the hell away from me. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like the me that was showing everybody is just thinking they got to know about Tony Robbins and I'm going through this thing that I'm sorry for. 
<laughs> sorry, everybody, for I get it now. Like you don't have to force everyone else to do that, but it was a given to me they wanted that, you know. And and learning later, maybe not everyone does. Thank you so much for watching. Just FYI, we post a new video almost every day, so make sure you comment and subscribe below so you don't miss out on anything. And if you enjoyed this video, I think you're really gonna love this one as well. And if you ever wanna see a playlist of all of my podcasts or all of the plot twists or any other category of videos, you can find links to those in the description below.